and one. Well, hey there, George. How's oh, it hey, Cameron. How are you? Uh, doing okay. No signs of uh, cabin fever yet. Um, stay insane, hopefully. Well, a big uh, hello to all our viewers. Welcome and thanks for tuning in. It's live at Epifan Thursday at 3 p.m. We're coming to you live from my attic and George's very uh, swank looking living room there. I like it. Yeah, I renovated, uh, cleaned nice. it up a lot. You know, uh, no, it's totally fake. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust anything nowadays with green screens and whatnot. That's true, but it is actually an example of a great tool that plays into what we're talking about today. And mm. that is in these interesting times, um, the importance of continuing to generate content, how to do that, and all the tools you need to think about and the type of content you might be trying to generate. So we're going to talk about different types, different styles, different tools. And uh, hopefully there's something here that will help you create content uh, while you're, you know, locked in your house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As everyone watching is aware of, uh, right now we're kind of in the midst of this global pandemic thingy and it's causing problems and we're definitely stressing uh, as much of the networks as we can. Uh, video conferencing networks, yeah. people are working from home, they're working remotely. I've, I even see people that are being hired for new jobs and they're not even going into the office. They're just starting right from home. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's a whole other challenge. Uh, but all of these things hinge around, you know, hopefully being able to do things remotely um, as we have been doing. Uh, this is our third live at Epifan show that we have done remotely entirely where no one is in the office doing it. Um, so we thought maybe we'd uh, pull back the curtain a little bit today too on how exactly we're doing some of those things. So that'll be towards the end of the show. Um, but keeping in touch in general is one of the biggest challenges, whether you're a content creator, a business who's trying to get marketing materials out there, um, or just talking to friends and family. And so there's lots of different tools available, of course. Um, you know, I think everyone is familiar with the usual suspects, uh, your Skype, your Zoom, mm -hmm. FaceTime, uh, you know, Google Hangouts, Google Duo, whatever, whatever you have available. There's tons of options out there. And they all kind of offer different possibilities in terms of do they have a cost? If they're free, what comes along with free versus what you might have to pay for and so on and so on. So we're going to try and break that down a little bit too. Um, well, in the, then, uh, in the shot on the left there, you can see a meeting from earlier this week. That's uh, Mike down in Palo Alto. And I think we had most of the team actually appear on that, on that, yeah. that big group chat. So on the right side, there's, I think, at least 50, 50 individual sessions there. It's at five by six, so 35. Yeah, in that case, um, you know, we, we use Zoom and we'll talk more about that. Um, but in that case, Zoom maxes out on a certain display. So if we try to bring, you know, 50 people into a room, it actually ends up on like two or three pages of thumbnails on Zoom. You have to kind of flip between them because there's so many people. Um, but there's lots of ways of, of leveraging uh, that to obviously have meetings and, and so on. And I think a lot of people are used to these uh, tools for remote work now. Um, but they're definitely being, uh, you know, much more heavily used now uh, in the current conditions. And so the big question is, you know, which one might you want to choose? Um, again, we use Zoom. Um, there's a number of reasons why. Um, we didn't necessarily specifically choose Zoom for remote production. Um, actually, we as a company started using Zoom long before this ever broke. Um, partially for uh, our employees who do work remotely every day normally, uh, like many of our sales team do. Um, but we also wanted to look at using a more cloud-based uh, phone system as well. Um, and Zoom is, is a company that offers that in part of their professional paid packages. So, you know, there's a lot of things there that, and, and of course, in our interactions with our customers, especially myself, um, I do a lot of demos and a lot of meetings with, with customers. And so I've used pretty much every video conferencing method under the sun. Um, I've used WebEx, I've used Skype, I've used Google Hangouts, um, all of those things. And, you know, uh, I think in my impression, 
my professional opinion <laughs> um, that that honestly zoom is um one of the better options uh partially because its simplicity and its use um and the tool set that's available um, but also the quality of what you can get out of it um there's many video conferencing software out there that uh aren't as good at certain things and overall I would say that Zoom probably has the best cross section of everything. Um, probably the biggest has been very useful for us, obviously with uh, replacing our hardware in the office that we have for phones, like all the hard lines. Pardon me. Yeah. Uh, Zoom rooms as well, so we have rooms that are set up specifically as meeting spaces, so that you know we Pretty don't empty have to these days. Room. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they're a little a little underused these days. That's true, but. You know, a lot of the same principles carry over to this virtual office that we have now. And Absolutely. it does bring a lot of connectivity between us and our Palo Alto office. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think the other thing to keep in mind, though, when you're considering Zoom, of course, is that, um, you know, we obviously have a business package. It's a paid package with Zoom. It is possible to use Zoom for free. Um, and it's a great example of, honestly, any of the platforms out there, the limitations of what you do for free. Um, the primary limitation with Zoom when you use it for free is that meetings are capped at 40 minutes. Uh, you can't exceed that unless you pay Zoom for a, for a professional package. Um, and you'll find other limitations on other products. Maybe they limit the quality of the camera that you're allowed to bring in. You can't get HD, for example. You'd only get standard definition or maybe it's time limits or number of participant limits, which is what Skype primarily does. If you don't pay for Skype, you have a limited number of people that can be in a single video call at a time. Um, so there's various limitations there to keep in mind when you're selecting which one of these you might want to use for your content creation or for your business use. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Well, but in um, to answer a question that we had come in on the chat here real quick, uh, we're going to be revealing a little bit more of how we're how we're hosting this event today or this live stream event. But um, yes, for Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. <laughs> uh, so we are using Zoom right now. And what we're actually doing is hosting the Zoom meeting and then breaking those two feeds up and yeah. using our uh, our layout editor to put it up on the screen simultaneously. Yeah, so we're going to. Um... I'm going to show that in a little more detail a little later on, but from a purely content creation perspective, which is definitely more of Cameron's wheelhouse than mine, I think it really breaks down into two main categories, recording and creating VOD content, which you might just be posting mm -hmm. recorded video to YouTube or something like that. It's obviously very common for marketing exercises. And then there's also, of course, live streaming, which we're doing right now um, and is definitely uh, become a major thing in the past three weeks. Um, I, I honestly don't even know how to express to all our viewers the difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic <laughs> live streaming use. It, it really is night and day. It's exploded. And I mean, what we've seen, aside from every single company that you've ever given your email address to telling you how they're going to deal with the pandemic, we've seen a lot of companies that have been really agile with the kind of communication and content that they're putting out. So, you know, maybe before they close their office, a couple of the creative guys grabbed cameras, they grabbed some lights. Uh, exactly. We've seen, you know, our friends over at Wistia, they've been producing some really good content. And I would suspect that they're obviously doing it as VOD content. So they're recording the content and then doing quite a bit of post on it, but they are still using video conferencing tools so that they can interact with each other and then recording those ISOs separately so that they can bring that in to an editing suite and do the work on it. Yeah, exactly. And we've seen a bunch of other companies do that as well. You know, TMZ, um, where Cameron gets all his news, apparently, I've just learned. Um, and, now, and a I, few I, was other curious, I was curious how to, I, I did seek out TMZ specifically because their whole format is this big group of people who are less than two meters away from each other in a space. So I wanted to see how they were handling it. And they are using Zoom. And it's actually really cool. I think what they're doing is recording a Zoom 
meeting, so recording the grid view of the gallery view, and then they're actually taking that grid and masking out the background and then putting in their own background behind it. And it kind of falls down in a few spots because you see some of the names are getting cropped funny. But for the most part, I think it's a really creative way to do it. And you're still having that big group interaction because they'll have like, you know, 10 or 15 people all in a, in a news scrum talking to each other. And so yeah. they're still able to maintain that format. Well, that's one of the interesting things is that, you know, for those of you who have used Zoom, even when you have a big gallery grid view of all the people participating, the background is just black. Like there's, there's not really anything interesting there. Um, there are some cloud-based things we've experimented with in the past that we no longer use, usually due to reliability, that allowed you to upload custom backgrounds and stuff like that for video calls. So the, the ability to do that at beforehand does exist, but it varies by product. Mm -hmm. um, well, so you don't then, want to lock yourself into it either, right? If, if you have right. to change it later. Absolutely. Um, but the other thing that you might want to consider, depending on the hardware that you have access to for any of these things, um, of course, is, you know, what's what's going on behind you, because you can fix some in post and you can't fix everything in post, or maybe you're not doing VOD, you're doing purely live. Now, as we know, there's these two different ways that we're looking at creating content right now. And there's going to be some benefits for some of the VOD content, and there's going to be some benefits for the live streaming content. So we'll kind of quickly go into a breakdown of you know, what we see as being the pros and cons for each or kind of a comparison between the two. For VOD content, obviously, there's going to be a lot less pressure, right? You can take multiple takes. You're not up in front of a live audience and you, get you can go back and redo that. Yeah, you get, you get the chance for do-overs. <laughs> you can pull exactly. a mulligan. Um, as we've already seen, you know, we've been up against a couple of challenges in our rehearsals when bandwidth has fallen down. So, you know, we've got this great show lined up. We're doing a webinar or whatever. And, you know, maybe one of the hosts can't actually connect uh, consistently. So we have to find a solution, hardwire, hardwired internet or upgrading your internet package or whatever. So that's also a... Uh, you know, a benefit of doing VOD is so you're not reliant on that. Yeah, path. absolutely. Uh, you can definitely get better quality that way as well, because you could be just shooting natively on a camera and just uploading the recorded footage that way, instead of relying on, you know, applications like Zoom that are going to compress things for you uncontrollably. Um, and and so there's, there's definitely some big advantages to that. Um, well, something yeah, that we it, discovered when we were setting up for the show or rehearsing for it on Wednesday was that on, on a Mac OS system, you can actually record simultaneously in QuickTime and also stream to Zoom at the same time from one camera source. Yes, which is something that Windows will not actually allow you to do, um, where normally a, a UVC device, whether it's a webcam like I'm using right now um, or our own AVIO device like, uh, like Cameron's using, both are essentially the same in terms of how a computer sees them. Um, mm -hmm. But in Windows, you cannot access a UVC device with more than one application at a time um, unless you use some other third-party software to kind of virtualize it uh, beyond that. Where it seems in some cases, at least with QuickTime, macOS will let you do that, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, well, if you're checking that signal in between, it's going to introduce latency and you could have other quality exactly. degradation as well. So. Yeah. So, you know, in general, I think if we're talking about VOD content, I would focus on, you know, using a good quality camera and recording on the camera itself more than anything else, or at least using an application that's designed for recording where you can really set um, the, the quality parameters. I mean, even QuickTime, you know, QuickTime records best when you set it to the ultra quality setting um, or using something like OBS or Wirecast or something like that, where you can manually set bit rates for your recording a good idea. I don't think using something like Zoom and having a meeting and recording it and then posting that as VOD probably is the most efficient way unless it's purely about a remote guest. Well, and we, we did do that a couple of weeks ago. We had a guest on from New Blue and mm -hmm. um, something that I found, unfortunately, was the fact that Zoom did record at a very low quality because I didn't have the right setting turned on. And I think it came in at like 480 or something awful right. like that. This Couldn't guest. even get 720 out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And fortunately, um, our guest had the hindsight of actually recording it himself locally on his phone, which he did as a screen recording, which didn't have audio. So that introduced 
a lot of sync issues into the post-production, but uh, it all worked out and it ended up being better because we were able to pull that 1080 signal from his, his phone itself. So that's probably a great example of, of two of our main points there is that because it was VOD, it was pre-recorded, you had the ability to fix it in post, um, as they as they say in the industry. Um, but um, the other, the disadvantage, of course, uh, is that, that makes me shudder. <laughs> <laughs> the disadvantage, of course, is how many hours Cameron put into fixing it in post. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of man hours into into making that correction, and that's where a live stream can be an advantage. It's one and done, but you don't get do overs. So. Again, live streaming can be great if we look at that for a moment because you get much more engaging content. You get to engage with your audience live, of course, which, you know, I'm reading your chat right now. Um, so if there's any questions, throw them in there. Um, and yeah, I'm also very jealous of your beard trim right now. It's, it's, tight. it's tight. Yeah, yeah. I was getting a little crazy with uh, where it was going. Um, and then, of course, obviously with live streaming, you know, it can help get it in front of your audience easier mm -hmm. based on platform algorithms. Um, so we know, and we've covered this in shows forever ago, that Facebook and other platforms often promote live content higher than VOD content in some cases. Um, they promote well, video there's content. More engagement, right? If there's more engagement, there's more people watching, more people commenting, then that'll just go right up to the top and you'll see it appearing on the, on the news feed or maybe on the public feed so you wouldn't see this stuff for a VOD. Exactly. The other advantage is when it's done, it's done. I mean, who cares about post? Well, hopefully you <laughs> nailed it. Hopefully no one screwed up. Um, you're done. <laughs> and that's it. Um, and again, on platforms like Facebook and YouTube, it's going to convert to VOD automatically. And so you have that asset. Even if you do want to download it and do some quick trim, you can. Um, so, you know, you don't have to obsess over the post uh, and the fixings quite as much. Um, so but I think not as much work at the end of the day, right? Like we often trim our videos down to take the tail off, maybe a little bit of the, the lead in, but yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's easy within YouTube studio. But I would argue that if you're going to go with the live streaming part, you actually probably need to put more work in at the beginning to make sure that your setup is getting you what you want out of it. And so, you know, we have some examples of uh, some setups, including Cameron's home uh, Quasimodo attic setup that he has. Um, got banned. To I don't the know, attic. Did you just see that ladybug that landed on me? We have a ladybug <laughs> infestation. Lady. Sorry, they're all in so the scary. attic, yeah. Drop out of the air and land on you. <laughs> now, um, that's what George was talking about. So you're just seeing on the screen here, this um, three monitors in the middle. I've got an iMac Pro that's kind of the brains of the operation. And then on the peripheral, uh, a couple of different displays that's including some of the uh, remote operation that takes us back into the studio in Ottawa. Yeah. And so you have, you're using multiple things in order to uh, get to things. And I guess we're going to pull back the curtain a little more here to look at what we're doing. On the surface, Cameron and I are in a Zoom call. And so is a third party, a third person. Um, it just so happens that that third person is um, an unmanned computer sitting in our studio in our offices. Um, exactly. That studio computer is is essentially hosting the Zoom call. And it's sending a physical HDMI output from Zoom into uh, our Pearl 2 that we always use and have always used for every single live show. And then just through some creative layout design and cropping tools that Pearl has built in, we can trim out a lot of the nonsense and UI that Zoom has, clean things up so that what you guys see on the final stream um, is much tidier and we can do the, the you know, the two up split and all these other kind of things and do live switching. So, but how are you reaching that equipment is the big question. So as you can see on that diagram here, obviously everything is through the cloud. So before we were, um, actually, I'm not even sure if it was before we weren't able to access the office, but our networking team set up a VPN. Now you may not need this for your own uh, setup at your office, or maybe if you're broadcasting from your house or from a colleague's house that has a better internet connection, but we needed that VPN so that we could get through the firewall. So once we get through that, v or sorry, once we get through the firewall via just the regular internet connection, then that VPN connection allows me to have direct access and control over that laptop. 
which is absolutely necessary because when you launch Zoom, you're going to need to move these windows around. I'm also using uh, New Blue Titler locally on that computer so that I can launch uh, you know, titles like this one, for example, get our lower thirds up, and then also piping in questions from the from the audience too. Exactly. So you're you're basically remote desktop to that studio computer, but you also have remote access to the Perl itself. Um, and there's a variety of ways of doing that. Obviously, a VPN is a great way of, as the name is, it's literally virtually joining the local network mm -hmm. so that you could access the Perl um, as though you were on that local network. Um, and then the other um, way of doing things is, of course, the Perls in particular um, have the ability to um, to be remotely accessed through a cloud service that we have called AV Studio. And that allows you from the cloud, from AV Studio, uh, a secure tunnel directly to the Perl's administrator UI to control it that way. Um, and that can be done without even any of the other things we, that we're playing with if we wanted to. And so that tool gives you a lot of power in terms of remote production. And the, um, the AV Studio is set up in a way that you can access all those local functions, which is great. Um, what I've got now just on the screen share and before it starts to kind of double up, you can already see it's disappearing into infinity, but this is actually the, the three screens that are connected to that laptop in the studio. So on the far left, you'd see screen number one, which is basically just a, a shared screen into the Perl or the Perl is acting as an external monitor for the, mm -hmm. for the laptop. And then the middle one is the local the local console or the local screen, which we're not going to be able to pipe through to the Perl because that's the one that's on the actual screen of the laptop itself. And that's where we have a new blue Tidler Pro. You can see I can just click on that button there. It's pretty small, but um, in this view, they're all pretty tiny. And then on the far right side, that's where the screen share appears. And then that screen share is something that we're also piping back into the Perl. Right. Yeah, so there's a lot of different components to the way we're doing it. Um, but honestly, it's allowed us to run this show. Um, honestly, other than the fact that Cameron and I aren't physically sitting beside each other, it's allowed us to do basically exactly the same thing we've always done for this weekly show, mm -hmm. um, other than we're not sitting in a room together. It's a little more work because of all the remote stuff and managing way more screens than we normally do. Um, right now, today, we don't have our, our, our producer uh, person, whether that's, that's Lisa or someone else, who's normally sitting in the control booth of our studio doing the switching and making sure everything's running. Um, you know, we are There's kind of very much... Studio right now, Joe. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it looked great. Someone left the lights on. Awesome. <laughs> um, now, if you, if you can see, if you're eagle eye in there, you can actually see right in on the monitor. Uh, that's <laughs> what's being displayed. So that's our confidence monitor locally. Exactly. And, you know, so Linda just mentioned in chat, you know, it seems like a lot. Honestly, it isn't. It, it, it really isn't. Um, it sounds like it, but this type of setup is really not that complicated. And I would break it down this way. It starts with making sure that whatever your local setup is, is as high quality as possible in the sense that, you know, I'm using a good quality microphone that's in front of me. You can just see the top edge of my pop filter. Um, I'm using a decent webcam. It's not the best, but it's the best I have access to in my home. But it is definitely not a built-in webcam on a laptop. It's a Logitech C920. Cameron's laptop or setup is somewhat similar, I guess. And it's somewhat similar. So I'm, you know, pretending to change the focus on here, but it is on autofocus. Uh, I've got a, a, a 6300. That's a Sony um, DSLR connected to a AVIO, which is a 4K grabber. And that's coming in to zoom as if it's a webcam. So with right. the with the grabber, it just treats it like a webcam. The latency is is next to zero, right? It's like just micro microseconds on there. And it allows me to bring in a, a nicer image. Of course, it does get flattened out a little bit by uh, by Zoom. And there is some compression because yeah. it is still going across the internet. But uh, but it is really good. And I also have just out of frame uh, Rode um, microphone. I don't know if I can get into the shot here, but yeah. And it's out of frame and it's, it's just good enough for catching my voice on here. The other thing that's nice about Zoom is that it does allow you to do 
virtual background replacement. And we kind of touched on this a little bit in, in a previous show um, that I am actually using a green screen here at home. And that's allowed me to bring in a virtual background like the one I have now, or I can change it up to something you know, a little more interesting, a little more unique and, and personalized, I suppose. Um, and I've been playing around with, I mean, a lot of people at our company have been playing around with different virtual backgrounds to kind of make things a little more fun, a little more interesting. Um, and the Zoom setting for the virtual background, it, it actually is very flexible and very powerful. You don't necessarily have to have a real green screen, although it works way better when you do. Um, but even if you just have a blank white wall, it does a pretty good job of doing background replacement. Um, and I would say that's another strength of um, Zoom as a product, um, not sponsored. This is just reality. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're not you getting know, any discounts from Zoom. <laughs> no, exactly. These are just things that um, you know we can we can play with and um, and and work with to again just make that content more interesting in in different ways and uh and dress things up and and make things more interesting like i said well and if anybody tuned into our webinar yesterday uh Xiao is in his apartment in downtown ottawa and he picked up a fairly inexpensive green screen just off of amazon over the weekend so that was able to set up and it put him right back into the live uh, live studio right so, back in the studio like exactly right happened. back in the studio just like uh, just like george i'll give you the full screen view yeah um, <laughs> So this is actually a photo that we took so that we could uh, solve some of our own issues in the studio with the background when we we're doing chroma and, and making sure that the keying was set up correctly. But yeah, if you, um, I mean, if this is something that, that you are being mandated to do now, you're working from home, but you still need to make those, make that content, it's likely that you have a lot of the tools already available for you. And if not, you know, the global shipping lines are still open and a lot of these tools are available just through Amazon. It might be a little bit delayed, but uh, you can still get your hands on a lot of these tools and still be able to create the content that you need and be able to you know, reach out to your customers and put these messages yeah. together. You do have to look around a little bit. You know, we've been looking around at things like, you know, if you want to go buy a C920 off of Amazon right now, good luck. Um, you know, there's certain items that are disappearing because uh, yeah, this true. massive ramp up of popularity. Um, so those are definitely things to, to keep in mind and maybe try to find them more locally if you can while stay, staying safe, of course, um, but uh, always something to, to take a look at. So if there's any questions about how we have this set up, please throw it into chat. We're happy to answer that. But that's a little bit of a look behind the scenes of how we're managing to continue to create our content. Um, as Cameron mentioned, we did a webinar yesterday all about AI transcription and our live script product. We have two webinars coming up tomorrow and we have one on Monday and we're going to be leveraging a lot of this setup um, for that. Um, so if you haven't registered for those webinars, please, uh, if you're interested, I think it's just on our website, just epifan.com slash webinars. Check yeah, we'll out. get one of the moderators to throw that up on the chat, but I'm pretty sure it's epifan.com slash webinars. And tomorrow morning, we're going to be talking about uh, live streaming for worship applications. In the afternoon, yeah. we're going to be looking at live streaming solutions for uh, educational providers, how to get a how to get set up. And we're going to be talking to one of our uh, partners from Panopto there. And uh, Monday, we have some more content, which is going to be really interesting and very timely about looking at setting up virtual events and setting up you know, production that you would normally have maybe with a big crowd. And now you've just have the production crew itself. Exactly. Um, so uh, just a question in chat there, are you managing layout switching or is someone else taking care of it? Uh, Cameron's actually doing it himself. Uh, he's doing it all alone by himself. Um, <laughs> he's uh, being star and producer of, of today's show. Uh, and again, you know, being able to remotely control a Perl through just a web browser essentially uh, makes that very, very easy to manage. Well, and, and that's, uh, that's exactly right, George. Right now I'm controlling uh, the Perl through Epifan, or sorry, not Epifan Live, or it is Epifan Live. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I get confused with that name, but it is Epifan Live. So it's a, it's a, a graphic user interface that we have um, I should have had something prepared for this, but unfortunately I don't. But um, it's really easy to just click and I'll be able to promote those layouts. And it's something that I can access right through my browser, which is super yeah. simple. Um, I would say two weeks ago when we started doing this and it was our first week with remote video production and doing the show, I would not be able to talk. 
on camera as much as I have been today and also maintain doing the switching. I'm already, you know, looking around between these different <laughs> monitors and it's very obvious that I'm, you know, slightly distracted. And then of course for comments, we can get them right up on the screen, as you can see here from this comment that I forgot and has been sitting on there for the last 15 seconds, uh, right through New Blue's uh, web browser interface. So I can promote those, con those comments locally on my browser because I am VPNed into yeah. the computer in the studio. Whew, it's just that simple, folks. Yeah, it's just <laughs> that simple. Honestly, a combination, if you're, if you're a Perl user, a Perl owner, you know, AV Studio giving you remote control over the Perl directly is extremely powerful. If you don't have that, you're maybe using other other things, just using remote desktop software. Um, you know, there's lots of ones that are either built into operating systems or are very easy to use and free. There's uh, Google has a Chrome remote desktop tool you can install as a Chrome plugin. I use that myself personally a lot uh, if I need to access my home machine when I'm away. Um, you know, those those remote desktop tools really open a door to a whole lot of possibilities um, in the things we're taught we've been talking about today. And then just to get that video and audio in there, things like Zoom or Skype or whatever your preference is, um, just so happens that our preference is Zoom. Well, and actually that's that's one thing that we didn't point out on this. And that was um, one of the challenges in, in this setup was actually how to get the audio out of the laptop. And it turned out that we're just running that over the HDMI from the laptop yeah. itself that's coming into, into the Pearl. So we don't have as much control as we would normally have with our mixer and be able to control levels and whatnot. But we are able to control our local levels through Zoom, which gives us you know, a little bit more uh, ability to manipulate that that we've seen with other platforms, for example, like Skype or FaceTime, where you just don't have yeah. that ability to change your gain input. Again, yeah, if you're going to be doing this, I would highly recommend not trying to do it on your phone, for example. Mm -hmm. You want to use uh, a, you know, a, a decent computer so that you at least have the possibilities of maybe upgrading the camera quality uh, or using a much higher quality microphone like I am uh, and Cameron is as well, um, especially for this, because if I was wearing a headset like most people have and I had the big boom mic in front of me, which is... 95% of the time what I'm doing right now working from home because for phone calls and regular internal meetings, who cares? But when we want to create the content, do this show or do webinars, um, you know, I have that microphone, I have earbuds in um, so that visually things look better and it sounds better um, and, and it gives me more control over how I can do things. Um, and so that has its downsides too. Um, if, you know, my neighbors started doing construction right now, uh, that would be a bit of a disaster. Um, but luckily that, that hasn't happened today. Well, I can hear the rain is starting to fall. So I'm surprised it hasn't started to rattle our tin roof here, but, um, yeah. uh, and to answer Linda's question, we will include all of the links. So, uh, after the show is done and we do some trimming on it, I'll make sure to include all of the links for the products that we talked about, including our cameras, uh, George's webcam microphone, my, uh, my microphone as well. So I'll have those up in case you are looking to replicate some of the setup that we have here. And of course we did talk about that a couple of weeks ago on how to improve your home video conferencing setup. Yeah. A lot of those tools are listed there as well. Perfect. I think that'll do it for this week. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, once again, we're here every Thursday <laughs> without fail so far. Uh, and we'll continue uh, well, to do we're so. From home, we're here 24 <laughs> seven all day long. Trying really hard not to be, <laughs> but uh, here we are. Uh, so if there's any questions about any of this stuff going forward, if you need to consult with us on, on anything, on which products we might recommend, uh, to help with improving your content while you might be uh, stuck at home, please reach out to our team, send us an email, um, give us a call, jump on live chat on our website, and uh, we're happy to assist. And uh, until next time, we will see you next week. What is next week's topic? Do we even have a topic? Do we, have a, we do have a topic for next week. So uh, we're going to be looking at solutions for telehealth. Now, um, if you've had a doctor's appointment in the last couple of weeks, or maybe you feel like you were... Uh, maybe get a test positive for COVID. You might have already had a an online doctor's appointment, something that was virtual. So we're going to be getting into a little bit more of that and kind of look at some of the solutions and even just talk about it as you know, kind of a theoretical level as well. 
Absolutely. And again, just a reminder, check out those webinars over the next couple of days. There's probably a subject there that uh, you, you might be interested in. And share that with anyone you know who might be interested. As always, like, subscribe, follow, all the socially things on all the platforms as usual. And, Do all the uh, social stuff. Where's the button? It's over here somewhere. Exactly. They the said button. physically socially isolate, not uh, <laughs> virtually. So and now is the time to double uh, down on the virtual. <laughs> All right, George. Well, it was nice hanging out with you today and we'll, um, I guess we'll see you tomorrow, but thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks.